Right, so good morning everybody and thank you for joining this morning's uh, webinar introducing CSI's exciting and groundbreaking new product Brand Dimensions. Just before we start with the presentation, as we've got a large audience today, please could everyone make sure that the camera is turned off and the microphone is on mute. Secondly, if you want to ask a question of the team, please pop it in the chat or if you're not feeling particularly brave today, send it to Chris Liddington directly please. And also if you can make sure your full name is on your Zoom profile and you can do this by clicking on the three dots if you hover over your profile on the top right of the screen. So the plan today is for us to present for about 45 minutes and then have a Q&A at the end. The meeting is being recorded and we will share the video on the slides after the event. <clears throat> so today I'll be joined by three of my CACI colleagues who will introduce themselves in a sec. So let's begin. Here at CACI, we're all about understanding people, behaviours and brands, who they are, what they do, how they perform, where they live, and crucially, why they make the decisions they do, both now and in the future. So to kick off, we'll introduce the team. I'm Neil, and I've been a user of this data, both as a client of CACI, and most recently in my role at CACI, helping clients in the grocery and retail sectors understand more about their consumers and their competitors. Um, and I'm Rachel, and I have led on the development of Brand, Dim Brand Dimensions, the product we're going to talk to you about today. And I'm also an expert in how you can use real world data to help you understand more about your consumers in the property sector. And I'm Alex. I look after proposition for the property team, and I also head up innovation across CSI. I look after retail and allocation analytics team, and I work with a number of retailers to leverage this data for real business use cases. Okay, thanks everyone. So today we're going to use one of the most exciting data sets we've ever had, covering 4 billion monthly of actual consumer spend at brand level to tell you how brands are performing. We're going to examine the trends that we've seen in 2022, who the winners and losers were at Christmas, what we expect to see in 2023, and how you can use this data in your business. So what is brand dimensions and why is it so powerful? So can you imagine trading in a world where you could see exactly how consumers were spending their money? Not just your own customers, but your competitors and comparative brands too. What if you could analyse that information at brand level, by geography, by demographic and by channel? What if you could look into consumers' wallets and see where each pound goes to and who to? And what if you could understand all of that and understand how that information trends over time? Examine how in uncertain times consumers are shifting their spend profile. Imagine a world where you could understand the trends and performance of potential tenant and wholesale partners. And imagine a world where that information was updated monthly and you didn't have to wait for corporate results statements. Well, that world is now here. Having been using this data for the last couple of years as a client at CACI, I really can't emphasize enough how revolutionary this product is. There are no small samples. This is real, actual spend data. It's not survey data. It's available at brand level. Aggregation of brands isn't necessary. And tr transactions are profiled using CACI's ACORN consumer classification. And all this is available in an easy to use and intuitive user dashboard. And this is really exciting stuff that we're going to talk about today. So I'm now going to hand over to Rachel, who'll take you through how the product is built and how the, and the trends we've identified in 2022 using this data. Rachel. Thanks, Neil. So Brand Dimensions is a product built using transactional spend data, which is a read of consumers' debit and credit card, sorry, debit card transactions. Within this product, which is developed delivered monthly through an interactive dashboard, CACI are tracking the performance of 300 brands across the UK in addition to their category spend. In classic CACI fashion, we can split this down by Acorn Group and across over 400 regions as well. Brand Dimensions allows you to track market share to understand how your brand has performed relative to the category that it sits within. It will show average transaction values all tracked over time, the data set is broken down by channel as well, so we get a view of online and offline share. As well as tracking sales performance, Brand Dimensions also gives you a view on how the demographic and regional makeup of different brands across the country and how they interact with different groups and how that all changes over time. So we're going to use this data to have a look at what happened over 2022. So I won't go into a lot of detail about the turbulent year that we had in 2022, as I'm sure you all can remember it well. However, I thought it was just worth reminding you how much the cost of living crisis hit the media with people making claims about how consumers would change their behaviours as a result of disposable incomes being squeezed. 
Some brands did better than others and some categories fared, fared better than others too. What we're gonna do in this section is look at some of the consumer behavior trends that occurred in 2022 using brand dimensions to look at e in, in even more detail than we have done so far. But before that, I'm gonna look at some brands that have grown or struggled more than others over the last year. And um, what we're gonna do in this section, like I said, um, was look at some of the consumer behavior trends that have come, occurred in 2022 using brand dimensions to look into that in even more detail than we have done so far. But before that, what we're gonna do is look at some of the brands that have done better or worse over the last year and compare reported sales performance by those brands against brand dimension results. So, Firstly, we look into the fashion sector. We will look into this in a lot more detail later with the relevance of online shopping and Christmas, but I thought it was worth showing three brands and how they perform compared to reported sales. The headlines acclaim sales reporting from the brands themselves, and the charts show the sales over the last 16 months lifted directly from the brand dimensions dashboard. Reese recorded had re reported record sales over the last year and especially towards the end of the year as well. And in our data, we can see that it has grown and December 22 was the best year in sales that it ever had. Looking into online retail, we know the likes of Boohoo and ASOS have been struggling too. Boohoo claimed year on year declines were due to the fact that they were now out of the COVID period and therefore kind of comparing the two wasn't like for like. However, we can see significant declines in sales over the last 12 months. And ASOS sales were said to fall in the lead to Christmas. Brand dimensions also aligns with this statement. The house and home market hasn't performed as well over the last year as it did over COVID due to changing consumer behaviours as we predicted. One brand did buck the trend, Denelm, with growth towards the end of the last year as their online platform drove sales further for the brand. Boots claimed they took three orders every second online in a record-breaking Black Friday, and this is also shown in our data, looking at the peak that we see in November 22 for, both, for Boots across the UK. The grocery market is one that all people are interested in tracking, so I thought it was worth picking Aldi, one of the UK's fastest growing retailers. Aldi reported that their sales were up 26% as shoppers were looking to save on their grocery Christmas shopping, a testament to their rapid store opening programme and cheaper prices attracting more consumers. Brand Dimensions reported the sales this year in comparison to last Christmas for Aldi were up 27%. Pretty spot on if you ask me. So where did I get this information from? The data is all lifted from our Brand Dimensions dashboard, a screenshot of what you can see in front of you. Here this view allows you to track category performance across eight major categories and 31 subcategories. It also allows you to look at trended total sales by brand. If you were to have access to this dashboard, you could look at this for 300 brands across the UK. So now we have done some testing on the data creds. We will now look to dig into some of the big trends that we saw in 2022 and showing how brand dimensions can give you a lot more detail than we've ever seen before. So firstly, we will look at if people are really looking to cost save on their grocery shop. You might remember that if you joined our cost of living podcast um, and webinars back at the end of last year, we used transactional spend data at category level this time to prove that although people are spending more on their grocery shop, they were actually buying less products or trading down when we took into account inflation. There are a few hypotheses that we had for this, including people buying own label or cheaper lines of products in the supermarkets, people buying less products or people switching between different supermarkets. I'm now gonna show you an example of how brand dimensions can be used to prove one of these points. Using Waitrose as an example, we have looked at their Acorn profile over the last year. For those of you who are not familiar with Acorn, it's a geo demographic segmentation at CACI. It divides the UK into 17 groups, in this case, based on affluence, life stage, and attitudinal behaviors. The chart on the left here shows the proportion of spend from each acorn group for Waitrose. Um, this is in the color bars. In the black bars, um, it is the UK population, the proportion of households. 
Unsurprisingly, as we all know, Waitrose does cater a much more affluent shopper, with over a third of sales going through affluent achiever groups, and they are the blue ones. However, when we dug into this group's shopping behaviour in more detail, um, it became clear they were starting to change their shopping habits, with sales and Waitrose declining 13% year on year, but Sainsbury's sales showing a 20% increase year on year, as well as the growth in the discounters. This shows that even the most affluent shoppers are trying to cut down some of their essential spending. So the next theme we're going to look into is around socialising and how it's still important for consumers. However, we do do it at a lower cost. So using brand dimensions, we're able to look at the trends within the food and beverage sector. The charts displayed here um, show the proportion of sales in each category over time from September 21 to December 22, so over 16 months. Here you can see that some categories are doing better than others. Cafe and coffee shops and pubs and bars sales have grown year on year. In, con in contrast, quick service restaurants, QSRs, as well as restaurants have seen declines in sales. As we've come into the winter months, food delivery services have also increased in sales. And we're just gonna look into that in more detail. So, um, we have compared three brands within the food delivery service, um, Deliveroo, Uber Eats and Just Eat. In the table, I have displayed their market share that each brand has of the total food delivery service market. You can see that Just Eat and Uber Eats have higher market share across the UK. However, when we look at that at a regional level using maps lifted directly from the dashboard, it becomes clear that Deliveroo has a much higher market share within London, whereas Uber Eats and Just Eat have a much more national representation. Generally, these operators are becoming more available across the country with brands becoming less reliant um, on London. So in December 21, so a year ago, over a third of sales for food delivery services occurred in London, and now this is reduced to a quarter. If we look at how market share has changed, we can see that delivery has seen month on month market share growth, sorry, decline, whereas Uber Eats and Just Eats are seeing growth. This may well be linked to either Uber or Just Eats expansion across the UK, or the fact that the more premium service delivery is at a higher price point and therefore has seen a drop off due to the expense of the operators that sits within it. So looking at pubs and bars, they have fared well year on year with the likes of the World Cup and a COVID free Christmas moving, boosting performance. But we have seen over the last year that pubs are continuing to be, an attract, be attractive to consumers. Let's face it, we're British and not much stands between us and the bar. However, the way we are interacting with pubs has changed. And when the cost of a pint in London sets you back on average £6.50, there's no surprise why London bars and pubs could, there's no surprise why, sorry, um, that we are changing our behaviour. In London, bars and pubs could charge you up to £8 for a pint, or from recent experience, my horror, £20 for a G&T. But this is not just a London beer price hike, it's occurred across the country with beer prices increasing over 70% since 2008. What, what we are seeing is that the average transaction values of pubs and bars have decreased 12% year on year. When we take into consideration the increased cost of drinks in general, this is a like for like 16% decrease in a year. So is this a death of the round? To me, it feels risky to get in a round with six other people these days. When the person last in the round disappears, that's costed each individual a significant dent in the wallet. And when we cast our minds back to those days when we were students and for the likes of Alex, a pint costs only £1.50, it's no surprise that we are seeing students these days drive their average spend down um, by 33%. Um, there are some brands that have started making it easier for people to spend on what they consume. So Vagabond, for example, um, has implemented pay-as-you-go systems on Y machines, which stops the fear of who offers to get the first round. Um, looking at the restaurant and quick service restaurant um, sectors, um, both are seeing declines in spend at 2% and 7% respectively. 
With consumers tightening their wallets and increased costs associated to running a restaurant, it's no surprise that we are faced with constant news of different chains that are struggling or going into administration. Byron is the most recent victim of this. But there must be some winners out there who are faring the storm better than others. So let's look into it in more detail. Using brand dimensions, we have looked at the relationship of cost to consumer, as, as in transaction values, and the performance of different brands. The chart that you see here in front of you shows average transaction values on the Y axis um, and December year on year change on the X axis. So the brands in the green box here are a cheaper price point and growing year on year. Whereas the brands in the red top left box are more expensive and declining, looking at year on year growth. This really highlights the fact that price point is so important for consumers and brands really need to consider this going forward. There have a few brands that have started rewarding loyalty as a way to encourage price conscious consumers, but also help them retain brand loyalty and market share as well. Examples are Tortilla, um, who've opened a club where you can earn points and get a free item when paying on the app throughout January. You have KFC's um, New Rewards app, um, rewarding those who are loyal to the brand, um, as well as Frank and Manka, who are thanking consumers for their strong December performance, offering five pound pizzas in January. And I'm just letting you know that in case you don't have any lunch plans already. We believe that this is a real trend going into 2023, not only just in the F&B sector, but across a high proportion of consumer brands as well. And my final theme that I want to look into is the decline of subscriptions to ser services. It's one of the things that consumers were looking to cut back on when disposable incomes are being squeezed. So the chart here shows transactions across different subscription services in the UK. Throughout the start of the year, Netflix, Now TV and Disney Plus were all declining. However, towards the end of the summer, we can see Netflix transactions starting to grow once again. This is in line with the time where across the media it was advertised that people would reduce their subscription services and Netflix share price took a drop. However, it seems that we can't all live without Emily in Paris and consumers have re-engaged with the platform with other subscription services suffering instead. Using the dashboard, we were able to look into Netflix in more detail and understand their profile and performance of the platform. Generally, when looking at transactions, Netflix is more skewed towards a younger shopper. However, looking at their profile, it has changed over the last year, showing that there's growth that's come from affluent shoppers, executive wealth, career climbers, and sophisticates. However, the less affluent shoppers are becoming less important to Netflix, proving that the platform is still considered a luxury um, for those whose pockets are being squeezed. So to conclude, Netflix and chill is back on, but only for those who can afford it. Um, so to summarize, we have used brand dimensions to dip, dig into the trends we saw over 2022. People are looking to save money where they can do, whether that being on their grocery shop, being stingy at the pub or switching between different subscription services. What is clear from the data that we have looked into is consumers are having to, having to respond in different ways to the cost of living crisis. And it's important that anyone working with or for a brand is aware of consumer trends across their category and competitors. Great, thanks Rachel. So that's an overview of 2022, but what about Christmas? <clears throat> I'm going to take a few minutes to look at some interesting trends we saw over the Christmas period, which retailers and categories won and lost. What trends are we starting to see? How has the cost of living crisis impacted on customer behaviour this year? Are we shopping differently? Are we changing our habits? And did the cost of living crisis impact on where we spend our money? So earlier this year, as part of the cost of living analysis, we identified three key trends that we're going to use brand dimensions to test. Firstly, earlier in the year, our data showed that customers looked like they might spread the cost of Christmas over a longer period. We started to see a small shift in spending on gifting categories in October, so we've investigated this a bit further. Consumers told us they were worried about the cost of Christmas and were intending to spend less money on gifting this year, but where did they save and which retailers suffered? And interestingly, did customers also try and retain 
the experiential magic of Christmas at the same time as trying to save money. And finally, consumers told us they would trade down on their Christmas food shop, either by switching brands or trading into one label. So let's firstly look at whether consumers spread the cost of Christmas over a longer period in 2022 or left it to the last minute. The cost of living crisis has had a clear and visible impact on consumer shopping habits. Our data showed in October that consumers may be looking to spread, spread the cost of living, the cost of Christmas across a longer period. And we've absolutely seen this happen. All Acorn groups spent a lower proportion of their gifting wallet in December 2022 compared to December 2021 with the bars on the bottom of the graph showing the decline year on year in December. Interesting low, it appears the more affluent and mid-market groups to the left of the chart appear to have spread the cost of Christmas presents across the final three months of the year, whilst the most price sensitive groups brought more spend through to November. This shift is also seen in some key gifting brands with Pandora, Smith's Toys, Space NK and Ernest Jones all seeing a higher proportion of spend in November. But does this shift mean we've been less generous or have we just been more savvy with our money looking for better value rather than buying into more disposable products or stocking fillers so the brand dimensions data shows us that customers pretty much did what they said they were going to do with one notable exception the vast majority of acon customers reduced the amount they spent per transaction in the key gifting categories in their run-up for christmas the trend is clear we broadly spent around two percent less on our presents this christmas and the acon profile shows that the less affluent groups absolutely squeeze their budgets more than those at the other end of the demographic spectrum. There is, however, one demographic group who appeared to have no financial worries in terms of gifting, and that's lavish lifestyles, which is the most affluent of our groups. This group increased the value of the Christmas presents at Christmas by 3%, and it was premium brands like Breitling Swiss watches who benefited, with an average increase in the transaction value year on year of a mere 500 pounds. We also saw some really interesting trends in the smaller value gifting brands, particularly in some that might fall into the cards and stocking filler category. Has the cost of living crisis made us think differently about Christmas cards, wrapping paper, gift wrap, and those silly little stocking fillers that get used once and then get put into the drawer of doom in the kitchen? And come on, everyone's got a drawer of doom. It's full of batteries, charging cables, that old mobile phone that you'll definitely use again at some point in the future. And of course, those little presents that were funny at the time, but of no real practical use. How many of you didn't buy that special Christmas card this year or just bought a cheaper one? Some of the key retailers selling Christmas cards had a tough time this year with falling sales and average transaction values. The card factory at the budget end have booked the trend slightly with their value focused offer. So Rachel talked about the death of the round, but in this more digital age, are we also looking at the death of the Christmas cards? Those smaller stocking filler brands have also had a hard time. Both Flying Tiger and Smiggle, who trade into the stocking filler market, had a tough Christmas. So maybe we're all gonna have a bit more space in the drawer of doom in future years. So it looks like in general, we spent less at Christmas by purchasing less expensive presents. Looks for better value. We've shifted how we budget, we've spread the cost, but have we changed the retailers that we use for those gifts? And the answer seems to be yes. Brand Dimensions data shows us that the more mainstream high street brands were trusted this Christmas with brands like Next and Boots trading well. So we saw the super premium brand Breitling have a good trading period, but the reality is that Breitling is out of reach of most consumers and the high street brands that are in reach also had a tough time. Premium gifting retailers like Flannels, Kiehl's and Morton Brown saw significant sales decline across the period with consumers seemingly moving more towards those mainstream brands. However, on all premium brands that suffered, in 2022, we had our first normal Christmas for three years, and many consumers told us they wanted to have the full immersive Christmas experience, experience the buzz of the high street and get back into that Christmas spirit. And this shows in the data with brands like Hamleys, Lego, Selfridges and Harvey Nicks, who all had theatre and an experiential element to their stores, trading well from bricks and mortar at Christmas, creating some of that magic for customers. But what about the supermarkets? Almost half the people we talked to said they would spend less on their Christmas food shop. So let's take a look at what happened. And the fact is, again, people did exactly what they said they would do. Spend on groceries actually hit a record high in 2022, but we know that was absolutely driven by record levels of inflation. In real terms, actual spend fell. We know from our custom profiling that with one exception, spending real terms fell across all acorn groups. 
Interestingly, the largest drop is in the most affluent group, again, lavish lifestyles, which might seem counterintuitive, but when we move on to looking at the data from a brand perspective, it becomes a bit clearer. Waitrose appear to have seen the biggest impact from customers changing behavior this Christmas, and they saw a significant decline across all acorn groups, but most significantly in the most affluent groups, their core customers. At the same time, Sainsbury's saw an uptick in those groups, suggesting that some Waitrose customers had perhaps traded down into a less premium brand. Interestingly though, Sainsbury's also saw an uptick in struggling estates and difficult circumstances, suggesting that perhaps the Aldi price match campaign may be having a positive impact, potentially those groups trading up for a treat. And there was also a really interesting dynamic in the battle of the discounters, who let's face it, are in poor position to take advantage of the cost of living crisis. Interestingly, Lidl appeared to pick up significant trade in the most affluent consumer types. So again, potentially Waitrose customers trading down and seeing Lidl as a more premium of the two discount brands. Whilst Aldi traded well across most groups, but particularly picked up business at the more price sensitive end of the market. So broadly, Brand Dimensions has told us that customers have done exactly what they said they would do in the run up to Christmas 2022. The cost of Christmas has been spread over a longer period of time. Consumers have saved money by spending less per transaction and spending less on Christmas cards and stocking fillers. Consumers have sought out value by moving out of premium brands and into well-known and trusted high street retailers. And customers have generally sought out value in their food shop by trading down in terms of fascia. So that was Christmas. I'm now going to hand over to Alex, who's going to talk about 2023 trends. Thanks, Neil. Now, what I want to do in this section is something that's arguably very foolish. I want to look into our crystal ball and try and predict what's coming down the road. There are a couple of big headlines that you're going to be very familiar with, and we've touched on that in previous webinars. So slowing inflation, energy prices starting to ease, a seemingly inevitable but much delayed recession, ongoing strikes, rising interest rates. We, we've talked extensively about these headwinds in our cost of living series, among others, and the impact that's going to have. It's going to remove £12 billion of consumer spend from the economy in 2023. However, these are all macroeconomic impacts, and today we're all about getting into brands and into consumers. So three areas in particular I want to focus on. And I'm going to be deliberately provocative so that in true mad scientist style, we can test these hypotheses using brand dimensions. So first of all, is physical retail back for good? Did online overstretch itself post-pandemic? Secondly, are we seeing the death of fast fashion for a culture of make-do and mend? And thirdly, is the store an essential vehicle for driving online sales? So let's get into this. Now, unusually, the last few months have brought news that online operators are struggling. Made was an obvious one. But even big behemoths like Amazon are feeling the squeeze. And when we look at our UK expenditure data from 29 onwards, we can see why. Thanks to the pandemic, 2020 was a huge year for online shopping. But through 2022 and into 2023, we expect online as a percentage of all spend to fall before it starts to rise again. Now, this is driven in large part by consumers moving back into new routines, which are centered more on physical retail and also bedding in their new behaviors. Note, however, that this remains a nonetheless a noticeable increase on where we were in 2019. So there is a step change in online growth, and that's here to stay. We can assess this by charting all the fashion, sports, and accessory brands. So each dot you see on here is a brand. And what we're doing is we're looking at that average transaction value in December on the vertical. The horizontal x-axis crosses at 52 pounds, which is that average transaction value for that list of brands. So anything you see above that line is retailing at a higher average transaction. Anything below the line is more value focused. Now, along the horizontal axis, we're looking at sales growth in December 22 versus the previous December. So anything to the right is a growing brand. Anything to the left is showing year on year decline. So if you're top left, your high value purchase with declining performance, just under one in five brands. Bottom left, your low value purchase with declining sales, so not a great place to be, and almost one in four brands. Bottom right is lower value, but successful, the growing sales, so a little over one in five brands. But top right is really where you want to be. That's higher transaction values and your growing sales. And that's comprising actually more than one in three brands. So you have brands in there such as Reese, Levi's, Selfridges, but also sportswear brands like JD. Now, these higher value brands are a little bit more likely to have seen growth, suggesting a shift to quality over quantity for consumers. And this is a similar trend we observed in late summer when fast fashion sales were among the categories that declined as customers looked to make more considered purchases. So they were more unwilling to invest that time to make a purchase that may cost more, but will deliver better value for money. I want to look at some of the other commonalities that define what um, each of those quadrants sort of represent. 
we're going to start with the brands that have a greater high street presence. Now, we're defining that as having at least 60% of their sales in the store. This is the average for those categories. So the brands shown are more reliant on store sales than average. Now, we can see the number of brands reporting growth has risen from 57% on the previous page to 67% now. So two thirds of store dominated brands have seen growth in their Christmas sales this year. Reese talked about their record sales, but it's not just the premium brands. H&M and Primark, we also see trading well. And whilst neither have announced the results yet, Sports Direct looked to have had a slightly weaker December than JD, who have traded well with a higher average transaction value. So it's been a good Christmas for physical brands. But what about those online dominant operators? Well, these are the brands that have at least three quarters of their sales online. And these are more typically showing declining year on year sales with 69% of online dominant brands in the bottom left quadrant. Now, there's an extent to which this was inevitable as we came out of COVID and we moved back to the high street. But if you then couple that with postal disruption, people making more considered purchases, a growing awareness on sustainability and fashion, and a desire for many to get back into society and have that normal Christmas that was referred to earlier, we can see why we might start to have this stark divide. As an example, let's take Boohoo. They reported last Thursday that sales slumped by 11%. We can see in our data that this was the case. That's a circa 11% decline in our December data as highlighted by the point Rachel made earlier around their strong comparatives. Basically, they couldn't maintain that post-pandemic momentum. And if you're a good operator, you will have seen this and made plans to mitigate. Which leads us to made.com, who very publicly went under in October. Now, the writing was on the wall. We can see in their sales that the decline set in last Christmas with monthly declines right into October when they actually stopped taking orders. Now, the cost of living crisis alone isn't the cause. Their consumer was very affluent. The issue, was that they failed to recognize that higher pandemic furniture sales were not sustainable, nor was managing 200 plus suppliers as supply chains got squeezed. As a result, lead times went out, customers got spooked and lost faith and started canceling orders and also stopped ordering. And you see that going throughout the year, they were left in a cash squeeze. Now we update brand dimensions every month. So with this in place, you can see how brands are performing against their peers. You could see that developing as the year went on. So what's our forecast for the coming year? Well, if you survive the pandemic with a store network intact, chances are you're a good operator in the locations that work for you. You have consumers watching their spend and seeking experience, and they're going to lean into those brands that they know and trust. So we actually think physical retail is going to continue to perform well in 2023. Now, if May teaches us anything about those online brands, it's to be flexible, to make hay when time is good, but to focus on customer service and recognize when your time is high and when you need to sort of rein it in. One brand that's riding high at the moment is Vinted. With a low average transaction value and a very easy to use website, it's promoting peer-to-peer -peer selling on secondhand fashion. The lower price point is resonating in particular with less affluent shoppers. And year on year, you can see it's gained around, um, it's been graining ground with about 2.3% share of wallet. Now compare that growth with the leading fast fashion contender, ASOS. Now ASOS have a higher price point, but their service is great. Next day delivery, easy returns. It's the epitome of fast and convenient fashion. And it really resonates with affluent professionals. They've established a solid 7% market share and they, they're doing everything right. But with a 28 pound average basket size, sales are flat because it's just not quite of the moment in the same way that Vinted is. It is, however, faring in this climate far better than Sheehan. Sheehan has a similar basket size to ASOS. It's aligned to a less affluent demographic. And it's got a model that from a consumer perspective can best be described as challenging. Yes, the clothes are cheap, but there's big questions on sustainability. There's quite a long lead time. Returns are hard to do. And it's held up as this pinnacle of cheap. So after a massive spike in sales early in the year, it's been declining throughout the year. You've got to think, is this actually a sustainable model? And just to prove that being of the moment is not enough, Depop, which suffers many of the same issues in customer service as Sheehan in terms of the usability, is also seeing those similar sales. So it's not enough just to be of the moment. You also need to connect to customers. So fast fashion isn't yet dead, but consumers do care about your brand ethics and they still do still really value customer service. It's not enough to just sell it as cheap as possible. Now, Loaf are one of the big success stories of recent years, and they've got this national presence through substantial TV and print advertising. There's nine stores with a concentration in and around London. Now, one of these two maps is showing online sales. The other is showing offline. Looking at them, it would be reasonable to assume that the map on the left is in store with those deep hotspots around the stores. However, that's the online sales. Indeed, Brand Dimensions tells us that four of the top districts that Loaf operates in are ones with stores in them. And indeed, the other two where they get those online sales from are Lambeth, which is adjacent to the Wandsworth and the Battersea store, and Warwick, which is adjacent to the Solihull store.
So for Loaf, the store is a hugely important component in delivering sales by any channel. They're helping to grow overall sales beyond just being a pure play operator. And this is true of many brands. As consumers, we have shifted far more transactions online, but we also more greatly value the experience of the store, leading to us becoming truly agnostic and the store becoming fundamental in building brand equity with customers. So that customer journey from inspiration, transaction and fulfillment has never been so channel fluid as it is today. So to recap, yes, it's a challenging environment, but good operators will survive and the best will thrive. Among the inevitable challenges the macroeconomic environment is going to throw up, our key consumer trends for the year are, if you're an established retailer and survived COVID in the aftermath, you're probably in a pretty robust business. You likely have your stores largely where you want them, and you have an established customer base. Customers will be watching their spend, but fundamentally robust businesses will survive, even at those higher price points. Fast fashion is not yet dead, but consumers want more than just cheap. Maybe conversely to what you might expect, but when you are watching what you spend, you tend to want what you spend to last more and you want a positive experience when you do hand over your money. And central to this positive experience is the store. We are transacting more online, but we're engaging with the brands that have a physical store. And we've long said that consumers do not think in terms of channel. Successful brands recognize this and they will aim to operate as seamlessly as possible. I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk a little bit more through application. Thanks, Alex. Right. Now I've heard some of the fascinating insights that we uh, derived from our brand dimensions data. I want to talk through how this data is being used today by both retailers and landlords to support their businesses. To do this, we've outlined six key use cases for each area. On the retailer side, retailers have been using this data to measure and track their market share at a local level. So I'd never before seen insight into where they're winning and losing and with who, which hasn't been possible previously through the likes of Kantar Nielsen. The ability to understand performance of named competitors at local level is delivering um, the capability to understand the impact of comp competitors' changes in their product, pro proposition, and message on both consumers and sales, I meaning you can react quickly to ensure you grow and retain market share. Similarly, the data is able operators to understand not just the financial impact of their own marketing media campaigns, but also who they've taken market share from which customers have been acquired, enabling you to quantify the potential to roll out campaigns nationally. Um, being able to understand how key, different acorn groups are spending in key categories or with specific benchmark brands in specific geographies is being utilized to quantify the value of expanding their offer into new categories, identify concession partners within larger stores, or understand how to reach and attract new customers within their existing um, range of services. Finally, it wouldn't be CAC if we didn't talk about location. Retailers are also using this data to find locations for new stores by identifying higher areas of spend where they're not present and they have a low market share. On the property owner manager side of things, we're seeing landlords use the data to take proactive steps to speak to tenants they, they can see are struggling looking at the data and understand how some of the national trends today are playing out at a local area and impacting their schemes. By gaining rich insight into the customer spending habits, landlords are tailoring their marketing message, drive footfall to their schemes and make sure their, their message resonates with their local consumers within their catchments. By understanding benchmark, uh, benchmarking competitors to spend, landlords are successfully using the data to formulate their own leasing strategies and demonstrate the opportunity in their schemes to specific, specific tenants. And, and just like their operator counterparts, the data is uh, data being used to understand how uh, competitive schemes are performing, who they're attracting, and all enabling you to create winning um, marketing and leasing strategies to grow your market share. Okay. To summarize, use my data to say you can um, use this data to see how your competition is trading relative to you, which con where consumers choose to shop, how that varies by channel, um, and without restrictions such as low sample sizes um, across business. I'll now pause there and open up to any questions we've got. So if you've got any more questions, please keep firing into the chat. And I've taken a note of the ones that have come in so far. Alex, I'm probably going to direct the, uh, the first one over to you. Uh, no problem. So that's a question from Laura, which is asking about um, the data. Different uh, you can answer that one if you want. 
yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, the data that goes into band dimensions is from consumer debit cards. Um, we do have insight on credit card spending. We're not handling a product. There's a number of ways in which we handle that. Um, one is we have a um, different data set such as spend dimensions, which does have uh, credit card data in it. And that's looking at category spend rather than brand specific spend. We also um, have sources which are effectively based on national surveys um, and other data sets we see, which allow us to get a feel for where credit is currently sitting. Um, we haven't yet seen a suggestion of um, a particular credit increase over Christmas, which isn't to say it's not there, it just hasn't filtered through into our data yet. Brand Dimensions is updated very regularly, whereas the other data sets take a little longer to come through. But certainly as we ran into Christmas, we were seeing an intent by many customers um, to use Klarna more and to, they were concerned about the cost of Christmas. So I wouldn't be at all surprised to see credit spend increase once the data all filters through the, through the rest of this month. Perfect. Um, another question that's come through privately is, um, how do you account for the impact of inflation in the sales data? So we obviously we know what um, we are seeing what inflation is from the CPI. Um, what we've done through this at the moment, we're not um, accounting for it. We are just showing the average transaction value as it is. But we have got data sets where we can basically offset it. It's we tend to want to keep the data that's in the dashboard as actually is and allow different businesses, different organizations to offset inflation as they see fit. Obviously, inflation varies by product category. So happy to sit down with someone and work out what those variances look like. But if you are an operator such as um, a Tesco, it wouldn't be right just to discount the total grocery cost because there'll be non-grocery spend in there and that will be triggered by different inflation tactics. Um, so there's a degree to which you kind of need to handle inflation on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, we do do that when we do a lot of our insight. Perfect. There's a uh, question there from British Land on uh, Brand Dimensions and Retail Acorn. Um, uh, so does Brand Dimensions, so for those who don't know, Retail Acorn is the data set that we have that um, focuses on uh, using survey data to focus on how customers engage with brands. Brand Dimensions is focused on individual brand level performance and geographic spread and overall national market share. That's the really powerful part of it. Whereas Retail Acorn is focused much more on how shoppers shop brands and how they shop within shopping centers. Um, so in those scenarios, um, we would say it does everything that Retail Acorn does, but it doesn't do cross shopping within centers. So that would be something that we want to do bespoke with data that um, as a business you may have in. Have you got any more on your private chat, Chris? I just had something that jumped up on my screen, but it's disappeared again. That, uh, yeah, I can read that one. So um, which locations are the winners and losers post-COVID? We're seeing retail park stores performing strongly as an example. Got you. So um, we, we're seeing some really interesting things there, and it really does depend on what you take as your point of reference. So um, across the board in shopping destinations, we've seen... Um, average spend has increased substantially. Um, so footfall has, in most locations, has returned to close to 2019 levels, but is often a little bit down. Um, but spend has gone up substantially. So people are concentrating their spend into big shopping destinations. Um, by and large, that's reflective of what we see in this data is, is that shift from um, effectively more online transactions into physical retail as we re-engage with space. So we're expecting um, yeah, sort of retail parks and uh, um, big shopping destinations performing well. Um, high streets were also quite uh, good performers. So we saw in our um, surveys that we took just before Christmas that people were really looking forward to seeing the Christmas lights, getting back onto their high street. But I really do think we need to, when we talk about all these, really think about what we mean by good performance is it just where the sales are or is it by how good that location was in driving brand engagement and brand sales there'll be plenty of people who go down the high street and are very enthused and go away and shop the brands they've just seen online but the store has been integral into delivering that inspiration to them um this question there um is there is the option to obtain the data from machine machine consumable for, form um, in addition to the dashboard, so short answer that, yes, um, we we'll just need to work with you to understand which brands you want the data for and how that works. But there are there are both retailers and landlords today taking it in a, yeah, a different format in addition to dashboards. 
Um, huh. uh, Can you share the slide deck? Uh, is just one that's popped up. Um, the yes, we will share the slide deck. There'll also be a recording um, of this session that we sent around um, after shortly afterwards. Perfect. Um, there's a question. Do you have any predictions for Christmas 2023? Yes. Um, Thanks, Will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes. Uh, so, from, from my perspective, I think there's going to be a, and we're already seeing it, but a big shift towards consumers buying directly from brands. So, in branded retail, the likes of Le uh, Levi's, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Calvin Klein, Nike, where these brands are taking back, you know, focusing on direct to consumer the direct consumer of their business to make sure that their product and messaging resonates with their consumers and they get really get across the messages about sustainability but also deliver that experience to the consumers in store which sometimes gets lost when they go through wholesale partners and you're seeing that play out with you know i think ralph ren announced that it's open 250 new stores globally um and you know, nike reducing them the wholesale partners they're working with so then that's going to continue that trend is going to continue and as a result consumers will be purchasing more directly from those brands I would, um, the other thing I would add to that is um, we're obviously expecting a challenging economic outlook in 2023 from consumer perspective. So um, what we have seen historically in the past is generally when customers are facing a, um, I suppose, a squeeze on their income. And um, we think this is going to be particularly strong in London and the Southeast because of the way that the rising mortgage costs from interest um, payments are going to filter through. It's biased towards London and the Southeast. Um, we then see people revert to effectively what, what I'd almost call list shopping. So when they go to do their Christmas shopping, they write down a list of all the things they want to buy. And they then think, where are the locations I can go to get all of these things? And in that scenario, it, it typically will favor anything which is a big destination where you know you can get all the things on your list in one go. So those will be the big um, out-of-town regional malls, um, but it will also be big in-town shopping centers and um, outlet mall, outlet centers as well, because you've got a huge range of stores and also a decent value for money. So in that scenario, I'd expect to see sort of destination locations trading quite well. Rachel, this might be one for you. Um, can the dashboard limit which regional areas are compared to between brands driven consumer behavior changes versus areas of significant store store slash estate, estate expansion slash decrease? Yeah, so all the brands within the dashboard can be split by region and it goes down to quite granular level. So for example, if you look at London, we can look at it like Alex showed with the uh, loaf example, we can look at it by borough. So yeah, it's definitely something you can do. Fantastic. Excellent. I think that's all the questions. Um, I'll give everyone 10 seconds to quickly bash out another one. There's, oh, here we go. Another one's just come through. Um, do you think retail specifically in the city of London will bounce back? Again, I, my slight, um, I suppose, line on that would be bounce back from when? We are absolutely seeing that um, as people return to more of their sort of their new established working patterns, we would expect um, retail sales to come back quite well in the across the city of London. Um, it's quite sorry, the question quite specifically says city of London. So I am assuming the answer to that question is literally the city and not the West End. Yeah, square um, mile. yeah the square mile. So um, in the square mile, I would expect retail sales to come back quite strongly. Um, I think the key shopping days will potentially shift, but the general way we've seen people's behaviour shift through the back end of uh, 2022, and I expect to continue into 2023, is that people coming into the office three or four times a week, when they come in, they're tending to stay around for a little bit longer. So um, they instead of coming in five days a week and rushing home on the 632 train that they always get they'll come in and because they were at home for two of the previous days they've done they've seen the kids they've done pickup they've spent time with the family they're more inclined to stay around for a drink after work they're more in time to get, engage with shopping in the surrounding areas so we generally saw a trend where whilst in any given week um footfall was down let's say 40 percent because people in are uh, not coming in two out of uh, five days their spend per visit was up 15%. So you are netting out at the same spend, but you're spending it in a different sort of way. Um, I think that might get squeezed in terms of some of the lunch spend in um, city centre locations as the cost of living happens. But I think in terms of retail spend, the city should be back where it always was, just maybe happening in a different way. Yeah, and to go alongside that, 
in if you look at uh catering or like food and beverage brands that are doing really well it's your leon's Pratt's in growth it's is in growth coca de mama's in growth which just shows that people are still you're looking year on year now it's still showing really strong growth and we would expect that to continue for a while as well excellent cool. perfect i think that is everything so um i was thanking the slides and a recording of the session um shortly following on from this um, and if you've got any further questions, please um, get in touch with your account manager if you want to see a demo or find out more about how you get access to, to Panda Mentions. Um, yeah, please, please do reach out. I'd be more than happy to, to help out or run a similar session to this um, with other stakeholders in your business.